Sup, Chooms. So before I begin, I'm really excited to show you guys this. This is my ugly Witcher Christmas sweater. Let me show you guys this. Look at that. There's the symbol, the medallion of the wolf. And if you look closely at the top, you can see the various Witcher signs. And here's the silver and steel sword. So I'm really excited about that. You know, it's festive. We're in the holiday season. So I think this is appropriate attire. But anyways, getting to the subject at hand, I was really happy to see that there was a lot of interest in my last video on vertiporfin. People are really excited about new treatments for hair loss coming down in the pipeline. Well, when I was looking back at my previous videos, I found out that there's one treatment I have never done a video on, and that treatment is on the subject of hair cloning. What do I mean by hair cloning? Well, it's sort of similar to the idea behind vertiporfin, because with vertiporfin, you theoretically could regrow as much donor hair on your scalp that you would ever need, so you would basically have an unlimited source of donor hair for hair transplantation with vertiporfin. But the obvious question is, why would you even need to grow the donor hair on your scalp? Why not just clone some of your donor hair and grow it in a test tube? or in a petri dish. I mean, how hard can that really be? Scientists have managed to clone complete organisms like Dolly the Sheep, and that was way back in the 1990s when Bill Clinton was still president. So how hard could it be to clone some rudimentary organs like hair follicles? Well, that is the precise idea behind hair cloning. Rather than try to save our hair follicles, let's just say fuck it and grow new ones in a petri dish that can then be transplanted into our scalps. Now, Hair cloning is closely related to another topic that I've already covered, specifically stem cell therapy, and I'll link my videos on that topic below, but even though that is interesting, it is not the exact same thing. With stem cell therapy, the idea is to harvest hair stem cells and then inject them back into your scalp, where hopefully these fresh stem cells will then stimulate the growth of new hair follicles. So stem cells actually are involved with hair cloning too, but hair cloning is different because we are talking about growing the new hair outside of the body basically in a laboratory. When I did a literature review on hair cloning, I discovered that there are a lot of laboratories working on it. It's almost like a holy grail of hair loss treatments, if you will, but like the holy grail, it hasn't been very easy to cross the bridge of death and uncover a surefire way to clone hair follicles. So, hair cloning sounds simple in theory, but in practice, it is very, very complicated. Such a scientific endeavor is currently underway in Japan, and it is being led by Japan's most brilliant scientific minds. I think it's easier to understand the challenges of hair cloning when you realize that hair follicles are actually just miniature organs themselves. They are every bit as much organs as the heart and the liver. In fact, they are the only organs that continue to renew themselves after birth, which makes them pretty unique. After all, we can't grow a new kidney or a new liver, but we are continually renewing our hair follicles on a daily, weekly, and yearly basis. When you hear me talk about things like hair cycles, like I do in my shedding video that's linked below, I usually simplify it into a a few phases like the antigen growth phase, the catagen transition phase, and the telogen resting phase, but the cycle is actually very complicated and there is a lot happening beyond this basic understanding as you can see in this diagram right here. So the hair follicle is not a simple organ we're talking about here, Chums. Although we don't form new hair follicles after birth, we do periodically shed our hair and the hair follicle shrinks and then becomes inactive, and that happens during the telogen resting phase. However, the hair stem cells then reactivate and and the hair follicle reconstitutes itself and hair then regrows. The cycle then repeats itself multiple times during our lives. So the hair growth cycle is very complex and the hair follicle itself is complex with lots of different parts to it as you can see in this diagram right here. Not only that, the environment that the hair follicle sits in, specifically the skin, is a complex environment with different layers including nerves and blood vessels that supply blood flow to the follicles. There is even a tiny muscle attached to each hair follicle called the erector pili muscle. This muscle contracts when we are cold or frightened which gives us goosebumps. Now you may say, who cares about that? muscle. Why is it important? But the truth is, it actually is very important because with end-stage androgenic alopecia, where the hair loss becomes treatment resistant, there is degeneration of that muscle and it is replaced by fatty tissue. So whether this is just a correlation with late-stage androgenic alopecia or whether it actually has to do with the alopecia being treatment resistant at that stage isn't exactly known. But it does show that if we want to grow healthy hair follicles in a vat, we may need to reproduce not just the cells in the hair follicles, but the structure of the actual environment that the cells grow in. So clearly cloning hair follicles is a lot more complicated than just mixing up some dermal papilla cells and then some stem cells and then putting it in a big test tube blender and then having them form some perfect hair
hair follicle. We aren't able to do that yet, just like we aren't able to clone other human organs like hearts and kidneys. But it turns out, Chooms, that I think we are closer to cloning hair follicles than these other organs, at least. Like I said, there are a lot of laboratories working on hair cloning. The most famous of them by far is Dr. Suji's lab in Japan. Here's an example of his more recent work, which is this article here from 2021. Now, Dr. Suji has been working on this project for many years now. I know this because the hair YouTuber Hairliciously has covered his work extensively, and Dr. Suji's project has been going on for so long that I think a lot of people have forgotten about his work, and he's rarely discussed in the hair loss community these days. But hair cloning, I still think it is a very important innovation we need to keep a close eye on as hair loss witchers, because if it is perfected, which I think it eventually will be, it really could be a full-blown cure for androgenic alopecia, not to mention having a lot of other therapeutic benefits. So even though this has been a very long work in progress for Dr. Suji, he still continues to push very important scientific articles like this one here. As you can imagine, the methodology is very complicated, so I won't go into all the details. However, in order to grow hair follicles in vitro, meaning outside of the body, the scientist needs some kind of culture system that allows growth in three dimensions. Hair is three-dimensional after all, which is one of the reasons why scalp micropigmentation usually looks like complete crap. So you can't can't reproduce hair on a flat plate. There are different systems available for growing hair in three dimensions already, but even in these 3D systems, the hair follicles usually go through just one cycle and then they will die, which means they wouldn't be very good as a hair loss treatment. So we already know that hair stem cells are important for the regeneration of hair follicles with each hair cycle. The stem cells are located in a region of the hair follicle called the hair bulge. This is right next to where the erector pili muscle attaches to the hair follicle. So this is speculation but maybe the fact that the erector pili muscle gets detached means that the stem cells have atrophied and that's why androgenic alopecia becomes end stage, thus irreversible. Anyways, during the telogen resting phase, the lower part of the hair follicle shrinks, so this part of the follicle comes in contact with the bulge region where the stem cells are located. The WNT wind pathway, which is a hair growth stimulating pathway, works with the other hair growth stimulating pathways to then activate the stem cells in order to recreate a brand new hair follicle. So Dr. Suji in this study was trying to find the specific hair stem cells and the hair follicle that were necessary for renewing the hair cycle. It turns out that there are several different types of stem cells in the bulge region and they have various biochemical markers to distinguish them as you can see here. So what Dr. Suji was able to do here was pinpoint a specific type of stem cell that was effective in increasing the viability of lab-grown hair follicles. He was also able to find a culture medium that enhanced the growth of the stem cells. The specific type of medium isn't that important, but you can see some of these lab-grown hairs in this figure right here. These pictures were taken after the cloned hairs were transplanted on the back of a mouse. With the use of these stem cells, the majority of these hairs lasted through at least three complete hair cycles which is quite an improvement over just one hair cycle, which is what usually happens with cloned hair. If you look at the press release from Riken Labs, which is Dr. Suji's laboratory, he announced the results of this study. Here's a quote you could see from Dr. Takeo, who was the first author of the study. Quote, we found almost 80% of follicles reached three hair cycles when ITG beta-5 was also bioengineered into the hair follicle germ. In contrast, only 13% reached three cycles when it was not present, unquote. Dr. Suji adds in the same press release, quote, Our culture system establishes a method for cyclical regeneration of hair follicles from hair follicle stem cells and will help make hair follicle regeneration therapy a reality in the near future, unquote. So, the same press release says that clinical trials are the next step, but hold on for a second, Chooms, that may not be entirely accurate. As promising as this medical technique is, I am skeptical that it is ready for clinical trials anytime soon. I think there are still a lot of technical problems that still need to be overcome before this is ready. The reason why I say that is because this article here goes over the state of the art for hair cloning as of 2021, and unfortunately, it is not as optimistic as Dr. Suji's article. The article emphasizes that growing in vitro hair follicles is a very complicated procedure and getting hair follicles that cycle long term is a problem. A big part of the problem is mimicking the skin environment around the hair follicles. Some researchers have used 3D printing to form channels similar to the shape of the hair follicles in order to encourage hair to grow ex vivo. Others use some kind of collagen gel to mimic the collagen in the skin. Other researchers use different types of collagen scaffolding and transplant the hair growing in the scaffolding onto the backs of mice. This table here shows some of the different models being used to grow in vitro hair follicles. But 
If you look at the research on hair cloning, a lot of it looks almost like a form of alchemy. People are trying different microenvironments and different ways to fine tune the cell mechanics of the hair follicle, and it's all a really big mess, quite frankly. Most of the research is on a very basic science level with figures like this one here. So, I actually think we're not all that close to this treatment yet, Jooms. I'm sorry. It doesn't give me any joy to say that. I do think hair cloning will eventually be possible, but I also think one day cancer will be cured. I also think that nuclear fusion will provide green energy for the entire planet in order to solve climate change. I am 100% convinced that one day, one day, interstellar travel will be possible and we'll be able to establish an extrasolar colony somewhere in the Proxima Centauri star system. Do I think any of these remarkable scientific achievements will happen anytime soon? Hell no, I don't. Now, obviously, I wouldn't put hair cloning on the exact same level as interstellar travel, but I do think we're at least five to ten years away before anything practical comes out of this. In fact, I think hair cloning is even harder to achieve than CRISPR gene editing technology because CRISPR is something we currently know how to do. Cloning individual organs, however, is still in the realm of science fiction at this point. I mentioned how we cloned Dolly the sheep in the 1990s, but that's actually easier than cloning individual organs because with multicellular organisms like a sheep, all you have to do is take the complete DNA sequence and implant it into an egg. It's even possible to do that with extinct animals, which is why there is research underway to resurrect animals that have been extinct for thousands of years, like the woolly mammoth. Even that, though, will likely happen before we have individual organ cloning, including hair cloning. So, as a hair loss witcher, I, of course, have deep admiration for what Dr. Suji is doing here, and I am fully confident that he will be remembered as a pioneer for this remarkable technology. But I probably wouldn't drop the asteroid in hopes that this treatment is going to hit the market anytime soon to save you. All right, I think that's it, Chooms, but I will be back soon with an update on another slightly controversial treatment in the pipeline. Take care and God bless.